It's a pleasure and a privilege to be with you once again this morning. Every so often, we hear stories of exile. Somewhere in the world, we hear stories of exile in the media. Some of them are pretty tough. Certainly stories of prisoners of war is a form of exile. In watching the news, sometimes for some of us, the stress rises as we maybe relate to certain uh, countries or, or areas that, that are close to us where uh, things are happening and, and we can relate to, to what that might be like if we were in exile with those folk. And, and sometimes the feelings of exile run more personal than out there in the media, but, but more, you know, in our own lives. When it comes to family life, when it comes to church life, when it comes to work, for some of us, we have family concerns that, that carry with us as we come this morning. And especially as we age, there are often more concerns that come when loved, loved ones um, are separated or, or misunderstandings occur or indeed sin that's unconfessed occurs and there's a sense of loss or confusion that puts people in an experience of exile, feeling distant, feeling separate, feeling uh, removed. Some of us aware of this, contribute to agencies which support people in our community who are exiled for various reasons in society, exiled through drug abuse or physical restrictions, and we find ourselves emotionally wanting to get attached and help because we try to understand what that feeling of separateness, of exile, might mean to those whom we hear about. I've often wondered, and I have no answer, uh, does one feel exile uh, when they're in a wheelchair all the time? Do they feel separated? Do they feel like they're uh, different? I can't relate to that, but sometimes I wonder. And then there's the strange story of exile that's going on, as I would see it right now, with the two astronauts in space. Maybe you've heard of that, and you've followed the story where Sunita Williams and and, and uh, Barry Butch Whitmore, or sorry, Wilmore, are two astronauts who are currently stuck in the International Space Center through reasons that are beyond their own control. Uh, they're, they're in exile, <laughs> in space. What a unique and strange experience. One potential option uh, that's developing even this month is that there's a... Um, launch in September, uh, going up to help them to get back, but that whole plan uh, won't be fully developed until February next year. Definitely a feeling of exile and distance. And there are various forms of exile, even as we think of the subject this morning, emotional or physical. Forms of exile that become more personal. And our text suggests in the exile that was read is that the exile is from home, but whatever else you think of this morning and whatever else you remember, the exile that these people to whom we'll refer in a moment is an exile from home, but not from the Father. An exile from home, but not from the Father. There are experiences of exile that are not even publicly dramatic, of course. There are private ones that are very personal and very draining, so that sometimes we feel an exile because of our aloneness, because there's no one else, and we feel like nobody cares. Certainly this can come at a time of bereavement, uh, of singleness, of pain or the lack of friendship, you can begin to re realize that exile is more broad. It's, it's much more involved than simply the kind of exile that's mentioned in a text. Is there a feeling of exile amongst Ebenezer? 
Is there a wonder of the exile when for over three years now we've been looking for a senior pastor and somehow the Lord has not answered that request? Can we sometimes as a congregation feel a form of exile? The writer, the Holy Spirit, understands that kind of feeling. And men and women in today even are feeling more exile as a byproduct of the gender issues that have surfaced from the culture, not from scripture, but from the culture that have caused a form of exile. Like the dark night of the soul, when even God seems to have a deaf ear to us. And some of you can relate this morning. We often associate exile with punishment, but that's not always the case, is it? It is in our story today. Jeremiah experienced the Lord, and this was typical of a number of visions that you can read in the book of Jeremiah, some to which I've referred over the years. There was the blossoming almond branch that had a particular reason for that uh, 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 prophecy. The boiling pot, the potter's work, or an ox yoke or the observation of birds, and here this morning, two baskets of figs in this illustration that was read. Now, these figs were likely the first fruits put in front of the temple. As we look in verse 1, what has happened, the best, watch this, the best of Judah have been captured and sent into captivity. Notice, the best. The more influential have been carried off by Ebenezer, including the officials and the king himself, have been captured. And in the context of the first part of Jeremiah, there are two groups, only one to which I will refer this morning in the sermon. This one are those that were captured because some were left behind. Whole different story. But the ones that were captured are the best, the most influential, taken by Ebenezer. This text is for us this morning as we think about exile and as we ask ourselves three questions. And in your bulletins, you can use the notes and the lines there if you want. I have three different questions as I address the text. But even before I address the text, just a little bit of background is you may be aware of the 23rd chapter of Jeremiah for in that chapter it is very clearly delineated about the problem of false prophecy the problem of false prophets prophecy is critical in the Bible of course and in the Old Testament prophecy leads us through to the point of the significance of the New Testament as we've talked about before But within the Old Testament is a very strong illustration of the fact that at the time when the prophets were active, there were prophets who were not prophets. And why were they not prophets? They expressed themselves as prophets. They called themselves prophets. But the test was what? The test was one false prophecy. If there was one false prophecy, they were not prophets of God. That was the test. And Jeremiah 23 is quite clear about that. And it's interesting, just as an aside as well, that since that time, centuries ago, millennia ago, the test of prophecy hasn't changed with God the Father. The test of prophecy is still, if it's through the Holy Spirit, it is always correct and always fulfilled. And without going into it too much, you can remember with me, the stories of the last two millennia of people who have expressed themselves as prophets, but the prophecy didn't come true. And yet they've got followers, whether it's the Mormons or Islam or Mary Baker Eddy or JWs. They've all expressed through a form of prophecy that didn't come, that contained at least one error. So way back in Jeremiah 23, the Father is saying to us, be careful about prophecy. So let's ask these three questions. The first is from verses 3 to 5. 
What did Jeremiah see? What did Jeremiah see? And I find it so interesting that in the context of knocking prophecy, of clarifying it, if you like, in the 23rd chapter, in the 24th chapter, it starts off with what? God speaking prophetically through Jeremiah. Right off the bat in the beginning of the 24th chapter. And what does he see? Well, two baskets of figs. And one basket is very good. He can tell by walking past the, the temple gates where the, the two baskets were sitting. He walked past them. They were laid there be, uh, out of a sacrifice, a usual and important festival sacrifice. And they, were, they were put there, the two of them. And as he walked by, right away he could see one was really good figs and one wasn't. One was, oh dear, not those. <laughs> the, t the difference was very significant as Jeremiah walked by. Sometimes we only see the external. Our experiences of exile, of feeling distant, of feeling separated, are only external. They're only out there looking at a basket. Our spiritual perception, believers, is dulled, especially when we are experiencing a form of exile in our own lives. We need to be in touch with God's Spirit, of course, who Jeremiah was. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, came to him in this prophecy. We need to be aware of the same Holy Spirit millennia later who's still active, who teaches us, who challenges you and I about the sin in our lives, who illustrates the same Scripture to us, Old and New Testament, that same Holy Spirit. We need to remind ourselves of the activity of the Spirit when we're feeling some sense of exile. And to assure ourselves through the work of the Spirit that God still cares for us when there's this distance going on in our lives. And so Jeremiah, as the event is developed, mourns for the exiles there in Jerusalem. And he was supposed to, in the context of these people, all being taken away, captured, taken away, away from their country, for, for many, a great distance away into Babylon, he was supposed to come along and he was supposed to give them a prophecy. He was supposed to send a prophecy of assurance in the context of this significant, real loss. And the figs were the illustration. So Jeremiah saw the, 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 the usual. And just as the offering of someone's faithfulness is there at the gate, in a time of upheaval, as I mentioned, he notices it. And similarly, in our society today, even in church life, we may only see what is human. We may only look at things from a human, not a spiritual perspective. We may be caught up in our own loss and forget that there's a God involved in my life. In our society today, there are people around you and me, even maybe in family, who are people who believe that nobody cares. Maybe in your workplace, Maybe in the school classroom, on the street, in the family, in a relationship. There may be those near us or ourselves who this morning are thinking, nobody cares about what I'm going through. Nobody understands. That's our perspective of exile. That's our perspective when drugs take over our lives. That's our perspective when a death occurs. Does anybody care? Peace comes this morning because we know that Jeremiah saw something. He noticed what God wanted him to see. He wanted him to see the good things Right? He wanted him to see the basket of good figs. That's what God showed him. Yes, there was another basket. But for the moment, it was the basket of good figs. 
that he wanted him to see. An elderly gentleman, I guess a guy like me, was walking with his young grandson. How far are we from home? Asked the young grandson. Or sorry, asked the, uh, he asked the grandson, how far are we from home? The boy answered, Grandpa, I don't know. The grandfather said, well, where are you? And the little boy said, I don't know. And the grandfather said good-naturedly, sounds to me like you're lost. The young boy looked up at his grandfather and said, I knew this would be a problem. <laughs> looked up at his grandfather and said, nope, I can't be lost. I'm with you. Ultimately, the answer to our losses, my friends, is this. We can't be lost because <laughs> we're with him, the Father. What else? Second question. What did God see? First question, what did Jeremiah see? Second question, what did God see? Verses 5 and 6, look at that. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Like the good figs I regard as good, the exiles from Judah, whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians, my eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to the land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. What did God see? This morning, the good figs, and I want to be clear about this, the good figs are Judah. The good figs are those described in chapter 1. The king, the leaders. These are the ones who were taken away, but these are the good figs. The other figs are the ones left behind. Interestingly, the good figs are in exile. God sees a plan and a purpose in the exile. There's a lesson here about exile. A productive time of waiting. Hmm. The exile, watch this, was a productive time of waiting. Judah could have been thought of as the bad basket of figs. Good riddance. They're gone. No, that's not what God sees. God chose Judah and chose them and put them in exile with a plan and a purpose, my friends, a direction and a clarity even though it was exile. What I need to see this morning is I may be dealing with something of loss or feeling of separation or exile, is I need this morning to see God's perspective when I'm alone, when I'm separated, when I feel left behind, when I experience loss, when I experience tragedy, I need to catch a proper perspective of the fact that the Father, through the Holy Spirit, is in my life in the context of exile. For as we learn in chapter 6, it's an opportunity to build character. What matters most to the Father is the quality of your faith and mine. It is tested in the experience of exile. What is God going to see in you and me as I go through this current exile, which you may be thinking about as I began this morning? The separation about something or a matter or relationship or even with the Father that you're beginning to think about for yourself. What is it that you're feeling? What do you believe about it? What matters most this morning to, to the Father that he sees, what does God see, is the quality of people's faith. For it is tested in the experience of exile and distance. What is God going to see this morning in your life and my life as you and I go through exile? 
As we go through separation from some issue or some person or some experience, will you and I grow through it, be built up through it, or torn down through it? Will we be planted or uprooted in our experience of separation and exile, in our loneliness, in our loss, in the tragedy, whatever it is in your life right now? To the church, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 20, I will be with you always. In Acts 1, 11, the angel, through Paul, uh, Paul uh, the writer uh, of Acts, Luke, sorry, in Acts 1, 11, the angel said, men of Galilee, this is at the time of Jesus' um, uh, leaving the earth, Acts 1.11, men of Galilee, people of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back the same way you've seen him go into heaven. And all of a sudden, millennia passed from that promise in Acts 1.11 to today. To today, the promise is still there. Jesus is returning. And the illustration of the figs is that while they have gone, there's a promise in the Judah going, a promise that through the context of them returning, the whole story of the Messiah will come in the context of them returning. He has a plan, and God sees our future in that plan. Peace comes when we know that it is God and what he sees. We will not remain in our experience of exile. One day, a man tells the story. I took my three-year-old daughter to the kitty park in Dallas to ride the rides. And I put her on a small ride, at which she insisted on trying, even though it was the, quote, scariest. As she whipped around the corners of the kitty car, she wrinkled her face and gave out a terrific cry. I tried to catch her attention. Finally, I, I, finally, she did catch my eye and I was smiling and I was shouting, hey, I said, this is fun. When she saw that I was not terrified, but smiling, she began to laugh. What was once terrifying became enjoyable, even fun. I thought how our Heavenly Father will put us in some scary rides in life, not really to terrify us, but to cause us to catch His eye, to teach us that He is in control and that He can be trusted. What does God see in our experience right now of a feeling of separation or exile. But thirdly and finally, what is to be seen? And I think this is what carries it on and makes it more dramatic than just that experience. What is to be seen? Verse 7. I will give them a heart to know me, for I am the Lord. And they will be my people, and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their hearts. In exile, they will end in God's control. I will give them a heart to know me. Good Old Testament writing, which we are reading right now, is something that teaches us more. And the story here is one that um, teaches us that God is in control in spite of everything. This post-exilic period, as they call it, of the prophets, has a tendency, because it's true prophecy, to carry us through the generations and through the millennia. And so God eventually did come in fullness as a Messiah to these same who were captured, who were eventually brought back to Israel and were there on site when Jesus showed up. When Jesus the Messiah showed up, this Judah lost group 
who were taken away were brought back. When the time had fully come, God said his son, born of a woman, born into the law. When the time had come, the thing about God's involvement in our life, what is to be seen is the hand of God in all things. The control of the Father in life, on earth, in, in, in all of time itself. When time had fully come, he sent his son there, received by a woman who was part of that exodus of Judah, part of that history of Judah that were taken away. A people who will return to me with their heart. Jeremiah sees God's message of hope in the context of a tremendous tragedy. And so this morning, there is hope for the church. You know, with you, I sometimes think about the church, us, the church in Canada, the current situation in our country. I sometimes think about, uh, as a pat former pastor and, and being involved, uh, I sometimes look at the news and the media and meet people and visit with people and, and hear stories that are sometimes really bad. And I wonder, where is the church in Canada? Is the church in Canada, the Baptist church, all the church itself in trouble? And is a story like this, which sometimes we as a church can feel a form of exile, separate from the culture, not relevant, not making a difference, wondering if the Holy Spirit still works among us, where there's a sense we can feel of exile like we're separated. And this is a passage that says, what is to be seen is an ongoing father who cares and has a plan in my life. Not just in my personal life, but in the life of the church as well. For Christ is returning. Jeremiah sees a message of hope when sometimes you and I feel in exile. And the, the, the illustration I like to use comes, of course, from a bit of history in, in the 40s. There was a period of time in specifically 1944 in the summer, which they call uh, D-Day. You'll remember, some of you have studied. It was D-Day. It was the promise, the promise of the end of the war. It was the promise through the things that were going on that the war would end. But it was D-Day. And between D-Day in 44 and what's called V-Day, right, in 45, which was the ultimate victory, between D-Day and V-Day was nearly a year. And while it was declared that the war would be handled, it didn't happen for many, many months. And it's that in-between period I find myself now waiting for Christ's return, waiting for God to, to, to bring things to pass, waiting for his second coming. We are between D-Day and V-Day, friends, and there are times when we feel lost, exile, wondering in exile, wondering what's going to happen. And I want us to catch what God sees, right? His plan is not forsaken. His goal for your life, even in the midst of pain and loss, his goal for your life and my life hasn't changed. It depends on my obedience, my faithfulness, and my peace comes from the fact that God remains in control in his timing. This is the Father who through the writer in John, John 14, said this, All this I have spoken while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Verse 27 of John 14, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give it to you as the world gives. The peace that's ours in the midst of whatever 
feeling of exile we may have, whether it's personal or as a church body or as the broader church in our country, whatever that sense is, my friends, is a peace that is ours through Jesus Christ. And so Paul later could write to the Ephesians these words in Ephesians 4, or Ephesians 3, 17. These words I leave with you. I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with the Lord's holy people to grasp how high, how wide, how long, how high is the deep love of Christ. And know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. My friends, if it is in your experience this morning that there is a feeling of exile, of distance, of separation, for whatever reason, you and I are not separated from God the Father. We are not separated because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, because we've made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, who then gave us the Holy Spirit for eternity, for all time. Even in 2024, that same Holy Spirit is there, present to give you and I peace while we walk through an exile. It could be long. It could be months. It could be years. But for the Father, He's still there. He sees what you and I are going through. He knows you. He's forgiven you and me. He loves you and me. And that brings peace that the world does not yet understand. Let's pray together. It is our Father with humble gratitude. It is with a rest, a calmness, that this morning we're able to come before you in prayer and say thank you. Thank you for reminding us, our Father, of your love for us as the church and individual people, your love for us as believers, your love for us in this time, in this place, in our lives. Thank you for your reminder. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.